So once malaria has been confirmed by lab or biochemical diagnosis, treatment kind of has to start right away to give the person the best chance of survival, right? With as, as few complications as possible. So let's say we're going to use anti-malarial drugs to treat the disease, right? So to make sure we're using the right drugs, we'll need to know a few things. So we need to know what type of plasmodium is causing the infection, because some subtypes will just respond to drugs that others might not. We'll need to know how the patient's doing, right? Is this an uncomplicated malaria, right? With, you know, flu -y symptoms, fevers and chills, that kind of stuff. Or is this severe malaria with systemic, life-threatening symptoms? We'll need to know what we're dealing with. We'll also need to know if these parasites that are causing the infection, we need to know if they're resistant to any of our treatments. Maybe the infection was picked up in, you know, a part of the world known to have treatment-resistant malaria. So there's a couple things we need to know right off the bat before we start treatment. So let's say our patient over here, he has uncomplicated malaria. And let's remind ourselves that uncomplicated is still very serious. It can still be fatal. And our patient over here, let's say he has severe malaria. Notice that this guy, uncomplicated guy, is just hanging out at home, right? He's still really exhausted and, and fluey feeling, but he's at home. But severe malaria guy over here... He's in a hospital bed, and, and he's got an IV in, and he's being monitored, he's being totally looked after by the hospital staff. And that's because for uncomplicated guy over here, he can take his anti-malarial drugs in pill form. He can just take them at home. But severe guy, remember, he's having systemic symptoms. Maybe his blood pressure is dangerously low, or maybe he's severely anemic. Or maybe he has brain symptoms, cerebral malaria where he's having seizures, or maybe his brain just isn't controlling his breathing properly, or maybe he's gone into a coma. So he's in hospital because in addition to getting antimalarials, which he'll get through this IV line here, he won't get them in pill form like this guy over here, he'll need constant medical care to make sure that he survives and with as few permanent complications as possible. So let's talk about the types of medicines that can cure a malaria infection. So remember that there's essentially two stages of infection with malaria. There's a liver phase where sporozoites infect your liver cells and multiply into thousands of merozoites. And then there's a red blood cell phase where these little merozoites break out of your liver cells and infect your red blood cells. And once they're inside your red blood cells, they turn into what are called trophozoites. They hang out for a while and then they multiply into thousands more merozoites again. So we have medications that can destroy these parasites at any of these stages, which is good. So for uncomplicated malaria, the person usually gets treated with combination therapy, which means that they take a few different drugs to treat their malaria. So they take usually two to three drugs, because if you just use one drug to treat a malaria infection, well, pretty quickly the parasites are going to figure out how to become resistant, right? How to avoid being killed by that one drug. And in fact, this is already a huge problem. There's already a lot of drug resistance that's cropped up in different parts of the world. So that's why it's super important to use combination therapies to make sure that no potentially mutated parasites survive after treatment. Otherwise, one day we just won't have any drugs left that work. So the recommended combination for, for treating uncomplicated malaria is called ACT, artemisinin combination therapy. And artemisin in here is actually the name of a plant that we get this main drug in this combo from. The drug is called artesunate, and we get it from the artemisin in plant. So artesunate does a few things. It creates a really toxic environment in the parasites that can kill them. And it interferes with some pretty important proteins on the plasmodium surface that allow them to get their nutrients. So that makes it hard for them to stay alive too. And the reason that ACT is built around this artesunate drug here is because artesunate is really, really effective against all of the types of plasmodium. And because there's not really much resistance to it right now, which is great. So the standard combo is artesunate plus some other drug with a different mechanism of action. So, for example, one that's commonly used is mefloquine mefloquine here, which disrupts the acid-base balance in the parasite, and that's often lethal. To the parasite. Or sometimes you'll, you'll get a combo of two synergistic drugs, sulfadoxin and pyrimethamine, which stops the malaria from being able to replicate its DNA properly, which means it just can't really reproduce very well in our bodies. These are just examples. There's, there's other possibilities as well, though. 
So what I just told you, all this ACT stuff, that's the standard treatment of uncomplicated malaria caused specifically by Plasmodium falciparum. ACT is really good at clearing a falciparum infection from the bloodstream. Plasmodium vivax, on the other hand, that has to be treated in a different way. So for the blood stage, you could still use ACT, just like with falciparum. Or often a drug called chloroquine is used, but there's a fair amount of resistance to chloroquine amongst malaria parasites nowadays, mo mostly in Southeast Asia. But how does chloroquine work? Well, malaria parasites feed on blood. They actually like the hemoglobin component of red blood cells. That's why they have such a blast in our bloodstream. But when they're busy digesting the hemoglobin from a red blood cell, they release the heme part of the hemoglobin molecule, right? So it's just kind of floating around because they don't want to eat it. They just eat the globin part. And free heme floating around here is actually toxic to both of them, the parasites, and to the red blood cell that they're hanging around in. So because they want to stick around in the red cell for a while, and, you know, of course, because they want to live, the parasites convert this heme into crystals of hemozoin which is not toxic to the cell or to them. So chloroquine, and actually mefloquine does this as well, these drugs prevent the parasites from converting the toxic heme into non-toxic hemozoan crystals, right? So all of the resulting heme, it builds up and, and it just makes the environment really toxic and then the parasites end up dying, which is great. So that's the blood stage with Plasmodium vivax. But vivax is interesting, though. It, it likes to hang out in the liver as well, in a dormant phase, unlike falciparum. Falciparum sort of gets on with it and causes super severe infection pretty quickly. Whereas vivax, right, while it can still be really severe, it takes it a bit slower. So it likes to transform into what are called hypnozoites. And then these hypnozoites take naps in the liver cells for extended periods of time. So it's kind of like having a chronic malaria infection with a vivax. So you have to kill the liver parasites, and you can do that with primaquine, which is actually effective against all types of malaria, but we especially like it for how it deals with the vivax hypnozoites. Anyway, the primaquine works by blocking oxidative metabolism in these hypnozoites in the liver, so it stops them from being able to make enough energy to survive, so they die. Now, those are just the basic ideas of how you treat uncomplicated falciparum and vivax. You can see that there's quite a few different things to think about. But if someone has severe malaria, right, this guy over here, there's pretty much one thing that you always do. You stick in an IV, an intravenous line, right, and you give the person artesunate. Remember that main drug in the ACT combo therapy. And they can't take it in pill form. They need it to go straight into their bloodstream because there's not really any time to fiddle around with pills and all that. So besides the IV artesunate, the person will need supportive treatment. Remember, in severe malaria, the person might be having seizures, or they might be in a coma, or they might not be able to breathe on their own. So they're going to need respiratory support. And they'll probably also be really dehydrated, so they'll need fluids and electrolytes as well. So what sort of prognosis can you expect with malaria treatment? Well, if you get proper treatment, then usually you can expect a full recovery, especially with uncomplicated malaria. And this is all usually true with severe malaria too, but it's important to keep in mind that severe malaria can progress really quickly and it can also be a bit unpredictable. So even with treatment and intensive care, it still often leads to death.